So today we'll be talking about chapter 15, section 1, and we're talking about the new immigrants. We're going to be talking about immigration from Europe because at this time that's where most of the nation's immigrants were coming from, Ireland, England, uh, also Russia, um, Poland, etc. We'll be looking at why people are coming from those areas, um, as well as Mexico. Uh, we're going to be talking about um, really the, the beginning of Hispanic immigration, though um, Mexican Americans have been living uh, in the United States for quite some time, uh, really since the beginning. Um, in fact, the first Mexican immigrants coming into the southwestern United States were coming there before it was even a part of the United States. Uh, but again, we'll be looking at why Mexican immigrants were coming into this part of the country um, around the late 19th and early 20th centuries to be exact. So first off, I wanted to show you a map of uh, where people were coming from and what types of people were coming to different areas. And so if you look at these states here, most people coming into these northeastern states uh, were coming from European countries. But then if you begin to look at Texas, and, and this copy of your map is in your book as well, if you begin to look at Texas and California, uh, then you'll notice that most of these immigrants are coming from uh, either Mexico or even in the case of California uh, from China or Japan. But millions of immigrants have come in. In fact, most of us can trace back our descent to immigrants. And most are coming here to seek better lives. Some are coming here on a temporary basis to work uh, with temporary work visas and then going back to their home countries. But we're going to first talk about Europe because at this time particularly, you know, late 1800s, early 1900s, about 20 million Europeans had arrived. Most were coming uh, to find a better life, and many were coming to flee religious persecution. In fact, there were a large number of Jewish immigrants and a large number of Catholic immigrants coming from Ireland, Jewish mainly from Eastern Europe. Uh, Jews had been driven from Russia by pogroms. Um, this was a strategy used by the Tsar at the time to attempt to unify Russia by requiring that all Russians practice Eastern Orthodox Christianity. They were even required to shave their beards, and they were required to follow Russian culture. And the Jews refused to do so, and they were persecuted, and so they came over to the United States to flee. Um, this population growth is quite significant. 20 million people coming in in a 50-year period. That's a huge influx to our population. So this does result in a lack of available farmland on the East Coast, um, big competition for jobs, and um, it's going to create some interesting issues. Uh, for one, um, young people will be coming in primarily. In fact, it's primarily young people moving to the country at this time. Um, and so, again, it's going to create an enormous amount of job pressure, which will lead to an enormous amount of racial tension. But it's also an exciting possibility. I would be willing to bet that many of our ancestors came over during this time. For example, my grandpa's dad came over from France around this time, moved to Brooklyn, like so many other European immigrants, came to the New York area uh, because that's where the main processing station was for immigrants and that's also being such a large city where so many of the jobs were. And so my accent does split between northern and deep south because of that reason, because of my mom's family that came to the New York area. Door, as it was called, was the opportunity to come into the United States. It was seen as this open door where immigrants could come in, and they did by the millions. 
from all over the world. In fact, 20 million Europeans were coming in. Uh, around 300,000 Chinese immigrants came in at this time. Uh, many attracted by the gold rush. Many wound up working on the railroads, uh, farms, mines, and domestic service, uh, even in private businesses. Many Japanese immigrants were coming in at this time as well. Um, many had come in to work on Hawaiian plantations uh, to save up passage to get to California. In fact, Hawaii is roughly halfway between Asia and the United States. Uh, by 1920, more than 200,000 Japanese Americans had arrived on the West Coast as well. Now, people were coming from all over the world, as I said. In fact, even about 260,000 immigrants had come in from the West Indies, uh, many seeking jobs in industry. Um, but of these groups coming into the western part of the United States, the largest by far were Mexican-Americans. Uh, roughly 700,000 Mexican-Americans had arrived in the United States by 1910. Uh, many were fleeing the political turmoil uh, that was going on there around the time. In fact, when we get to chapter 18, we'll be talking about a lot of the political troubles that Mexico was experiencing around this same time. Uh, for example, after uh, Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana was ousted, he was replaced by a military governor who was then replaced by a popular revolutionary, who was then replaced by another far right-wing um, fascist type. So Mexico was going through some political troubles. And even by the early 1900s, it was becoming an unsafe place to live, unsafe to the point that many wanted to flee. Um, the, national, excuse me, the National Reclamation Act uh, created large expanses of farmland um, out of the Great Plains and out of the Southwest. Uh, large opportunities for farmers to come in and make a living for themselves. So let's talk about the journey to get there. Most immigrants arrived by steamship. Steamships have become a very popular and cost-effective way to travel. Extremely large steam engines, meaning um, a very, very hot coal furnace um, containing steam under enormous amounts of pressure capable of moving these large vessels. And so they could sometimes be dangerous. Explosions could happen aboard one of these vessels. Uh, most would have to arrive in steerage. Um, I don't know if you're a fan of the movie Titanic, uh, but that follows another common immigrant story, how uh, DiCaprio played a very poor immigrant coming to the United States who had to travel in steerage. It's the very, very bottom of the ship. Often immigrants would have to find work on these ships to be able to afford their passage overseas. Um, in fact, my wife and I went on a cruise, uh, not this year, but last year, and we're going to go on one next year as well. They're, they're nice. Uh, the cheap seats, though, are called steerage. You ride in the bottom of the boat. Um, if you want to ride in a nicer class, then certainly you have to pay the price. Now, most of these immigrants from Europe are arriving at Ellis Island. Uh, it's still a popular tourist destination, although the immigration station there has closed. I'll show you a photograph of it in just a moment. But it is, it is the chief U.S. immigration station in New York Harbor. Immigrants there would be inspected by doctors. If you contained a serious illness, uh, highly contagious, then you would not be admitted into the United States. Inspectors would check documents to see if immigrants meet the legal requirements to come into the United States. Uh, if you have outstanding warrants for your arrest, we are an extradition country, meaning that we will turn you over to the country you committed crimes in. If um, if you are considered a danger to yourself or others, uh, whether through mental illness or uh, a past history of affiliation with dangerous organizations, uh, you will not be admitted, etc. Um, but in the late 1800s and early 1900s, about 17 million immigrants were processed through. And so here's a photograph of immigrants coming off of the boat. And here's a photograph of Ellis Island as it looks today. 
Um, though now it's just a tourist attraction. You can go there and you can visit, buy a ticket, and see what the immigrant experience was like at that time. Uh, New York is still one of our main uh, immigration ports. The United States has long been a destination for immigrants from around the world. Immigrants are people who leave one country to settle in another. And New York City has a rich tradition of welcoming people from other lands. Ellis Island and Castle Garden were usually the first stops for immigrants coming from Europe and other distant regions. The first major wave of immigration started in 1815, after a long series of wars ended in Europe. Millions of people, most of them from Germany, Great Britain, and Ireland, came to New York eager to escape their unstable homelands. Another wave of immigration took place in the late 1840s as a result of the Irish potato famine. A famine is a drastic and wide-reaching food shortage. Potatoes were the primary food source for most of the Irish population. But in the 1840s, a disease spread across the country, causing potato plants to turn black and rot. The famine lasted for five years from 1845 through 1849. During this period, approximately one million Irish died of starvation and disease. And nearly a million came to America to begin new lives. For decades after the famine, Irish Americans would tell stories of starving women and children whose mouths were green from eating grass. Life for many of these new Americans would be considerably better in New York. Soon, immigrants from Norway and Sweden began to arrive. And Chinese immigrants also came to the U.S. in great numbers. A second major wave of immigration to New York began around 1880, and the people came from Eastern and Southern Europe. Seeking economic opportunity, large numbers of Italians, Poles, and Hungarians came to the United States. And Eastern European Jews came in search of religious freedom. Between 1880 and 1920, 4.1 million Italians entered the U.S., and the Italian population in New York exploded, with more than 2,000 community organizations in New York City alone. The population of Eastern European Jews also grew at an amazing rate. They were more likely to stay in the U.S. than other groups. By 1920, half of the Jewish population in the U.S. lived in New York City. Most immigrants had similar experiences during their journey to the U.S. They traveled by ship. The poorer passengers spent the journey in steerage, a section near the bottom of the ship that provided the cheapest accommodations. They endured cramped quarters and weeks of seasickness while crossing rough Atlantic waters. Upon arrival, steerage and third-class passengers were sent to the immigration stations Castle Garden or Ellis Island. Here, they underwent a medical exam and legal inspection. Those who had contagious diseases or legal problems were sent back to their homelands. About 2% of immigrants were excluded for these reasons. But most immigrants were allowed to enter the U.S. to begin their new lives and face a new set of obstacles and hardships. So next, let's talk about immigrants arriving on the West Coast. And you see here a photograph of Asian immigrants who were arriving and waiting to be processed at Angel Island. Angel Island in San Francisco is the main immigrant processing station on the West Coast. And so the same process here. Immigrants would endure harsh questioning, um, long detention before being admitted into the United States. But next, I want you to imagine yourself as new to an area. You've now moved all the way across the country, or even perhaps to another country. What are you going to do? What's the first thing you need? 
So let's just pause and think about that for a second. What's one of the first things that you would need as a new immigrant coming? Well, this is just, that's human nature. You're going to seek help from people who have had the same experience. They are less likely to judge you. They are more likely to be sympathetic to what you have gone through. And um, immigrants have the necessity of creating a whole new life of, like you said, finding work, finding shelter. And um, you're going to seek out people who share a common culture. Perhaps you don't speak the language of the place where you are going. Well, the first thing you need to find are people who speak your language. If you've ever moved from another country or if you've ever lived in another country, that's an immediate need, almost as much so as shelter. You're also going to seek people who share common cultural values because no one wants to be judged. So you're going to seek people who can identify uh, with where you're coming from. But this also creates friction uh, between people who have come here from somewhere else and people who were born here. That idea of nativism. And it is sad and unfortunate that this culture of nativism has not gone away that we've seen so much of that same type of attitude even in this election. This is the attitude I'm talking about. Native-born Americans looking down on immigrants. And this cartoon, again drawn by Thomas Nest, points out some of the classic illogical reasons that Native-born Americans have in feeling this way. You know, here you see Uncle Sam holding his nose in disgust at an immigrant. But the great irony here is if ever you go to the Statue of Liberty, and I have not actually got to go myself. I've been to New York, but I didn't go to the Statue of Liberty. I wish I had, though. Um, there's a statue engraved at the foot of the Statue of Liberty. Does anybody know what that statue says? Welcome. Essentially, welcome. Yeah, there's a big welcome mat on our country. Though we don't always act that way, right? The statue says, and I quote, Give me your tired, poor, hungry masses yearning to be free. It says, come on, come on, come on, come everybody. Welcome. And yet this is how we often view immigrants. Let me read some of these things for you. Sabbath desecration. Um, that is in regard to different religions that immigrants bring. It's good we don't feel that way anymore, right? Wink, wink. Anarchy. Different political ideas that people bring with them. Poverty. Disease. It is unfortunate that sometimes people have these attitudes towards immigrants. And this is a culture called nativism. Because like it or not, we are a cosmopolitan country. That means we are a country of many cultures and many ideas. I had a neat discussion for, with a sociology professor the other day. And he and I both agreed that multiculturalism, known as pluralism, is essential for democracy. You see, democracy means a rule by the people. Well, the people aren't naturally going to feel the same way about everything. Uniformity is fascism. Multiculturalism is democracy. But if we are truly going to be democratic, that means we truly have to accept people with different values. But that can be difficult to do. Because perhaps the way you live or the beliefs you have, perhaps you feel those are the beliefs to have or the way to live. And if you are raised and you have grown up around people that only believe those things and they share only those ideas that you share, it can be mind blowing to go outside of your culture. And that was my experience. I grew up in an extremely rural area. 
There wasn't a stoplight within 30 miles of my house. Everyone within my community had the same skin color and generally the same religion and generally the same political beliefs. And of course, that's how I was raised, so that's how I grew up. And that's what I thought until I went off to live in a community with people who believed entirely different than myself and people who had grown up entirely different. And it really wasn't until the summer after my first year of college where I went to work in Panama City and I began working with people from all over the world, spending all day with them working in a little restaurant where a lot of international business students were also getting jobs at this water park. I worked at a restaurant um, and it blew my mind. It was really an eye-opening experience for me. Now I can sit here and tell you about that, but until you have some kind of experience like that, it can be really difficult to open your eyes to think about other cultures. So it's something I would encourage you to do. In fact, in the spring, around spring break, I'm going to encourage you and give you a cultural experience assignment. And I want you to think about it between now and then. There's not a lot of details to the assignment. It's effectively to go out and do something amazing. To go out and interact with people that you've never seen before and to have some kind of experience that's outside of your cultural comfort zone. And then to tell us about it. Then you'll come back after spring break and I want to hear what you did. You can do that at any time. Anytime, if you have some neat experience like that, please raise your hand, stop class, we'll stop wherever we are, and I want to hear about it. Because that's social studies. That's going outside and really learning and having that experience. Because you see, when you associate yourself only with like-minded people, then you begin to develop this feeling that your way is the way. For example, many nativists, of course, were white, were Protestant and were native born, obviously. And many felt their way was superior to other peoples. Many objected to other religions that immigrants brought with them. Um, and many pressured Congress to pass laws restricting the rights of immigrants, such as a literacy bill for immigrants requiring that immigrants prove they can read and write in English prior to achieving citizenship. Many thought they had left behind prejudice and discrimination, only to experience it again in the U.S. Irish were frequently singled out because they were Catholic. In 1831, Protestants set St. Mary's Catholic Church in New York City on fire. Discrimination against the Chinese was even more common, largely due to U.S. government policies. In 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act made it illegal for Chinese immigrants to enter the country. And those already in the U.S. were not eligible for citizenship. The law stopped the growth of the Chinese community in New York. Employment was also a problem. Greedy factory owners often took advantage of the immigrants' poverty and poor language skills to get cheap labor. Often men, women, and children would work long hours in sweatshops or factories with low wages and dangerous and dirty working conditions. Children were especially at risk. Child labor was usually the result of kidnapping or an arrangement with desperately poor parents. Sometimes children were sent out as beggars, roaming the streets of New York City. The living conditions for many immigrants were equally horrifying. All too often, crowded slums were the only housing a family could afford. These tenements were known for their crowded and dirty conditions. And violence was common. The Five Points area of New York City was notorious for the large number of gangs and frequent riots. But the immigrant experience is not just about hardship and discrimination. Many established new, successful lives here. Immigrants have been coming to New York for centuries, and they continue to arrive every day. Nativism found a foothold in the labor movement. 
it is sad that when you take a people who are downtrodden and you give them a common enemy, that can make people blind to their own plight. One of my favorite folk songs in regards to this subject is Bob Dylan's Only a Pawn in Their Game. And one of the lines in the song says, when you teach a man that he is better than them because of the color of his skin, it makes him ignore the shape that he is in. That he is in the caboose on the train. That he is only a pawn in their game. It is unfortunate that people as downtrodden as the American worker would find a common enemy in the immigrants. Because unfortunately, when you come to a place as a new person, you find yourself having to work for less than what others might. And that's because your situation is desperate. You know, perhaps your citizenship is questionable. Perhaps your immigration status is questionable. And because of these things, the only opportunities that may be available to you are less than savory and don't pay terribly well. And that has been the common immigrant experience in our country's history. It is going on now, and sadly has been going on throughout our country's history. Whereas today it is many Hispanic immigrants. At this time on the West Coast, it was Chinese immigrants who would be forced to work for less. And labor groups would exert political pressure to restrict immigration. Just as many poor today are using, and many poor are being used to consider immigrants a scapegoat to the plight that they're in. In fact, Congress was pressured in 1882 to pass the Chinese Exclusion Act, which banned entry to Chinese immigrants altogether. Nativists feared an extension to the Japanese immigrants and most Asians in general in the early 1900s. Uh, for example, San Francisco uh, had segregated schools. Japanese school children were forced to go to their own schools and not allowed to integrate with white Americans there. Uh, in fact, Japanese uh, excuse me, the country of Japan agreed to limit immigration and in return the United States would um, grant greater rights for uh, Japanese immigrants living there. The sad part here is that the Chinese Exclusion Act built a wall, not a literal wall, but a, a wall nonetheless barring entry of Chinese immigrants. In fact, there were many cases of riots against immigrants, violent acts against immigrants. 